Okay, here we are. And uh, I think we lost one or two. Maybe the pizza did them in. <laughs> Thanks for the pizza. That was nice. Enjoyed it. Nice to be with you again. And so we are um, looking at the subject of what is the assembly. And we talked about the assembly as a testimony and the importance of shining our light for the Lord and helping people come to know the Lord. Another important thing that characterizes the assembly is the assembly is a school. Assembly is to be a school. And I've heard this from old preachers in the past, and it makes a lot of sense to me. And we'll look at some scriptures and think through this issue to help realize that we need to be good students and uh, learn what the Lord has for us. But let's begin by asking the Lord's blessing on our time that we might be alert after the pizza and we will take in what he has. Father in heaven, we are grateful this evening to be together as believers and to be under the sound of your word. We pray the Holy Spirit will take over and take the meager thoughts of a preacher and turn them into spiritual food for us to feast upon. Father, we just ask for your help and blessing, for without you we could do nothing. And we pray you would edify and encourage us, and that we go home changed, rejoicing, and the better for having been here. And we just ask your blessing on us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now for this evening's message, I would like to read from uh, 1, Timothy chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. If I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Now, this tells us that the church is to uphold the truth. Sorry, am I blocking your way? Um, the church is to uphold the truth. The truth does not depend on the church, but the church is used by God to uh, uphold it, to strengthen it, just like a house has a foundation and walls to support it. So the church is to support the truth. And um, that means we have to come to listen to the word of God. Come to listen to the word of God. Now, why do I show this picture? Because sometimes... When we come on a regular basis to hear message after message, it becomes kind of mundane, like, oh, here we go again, another message. We don't really come with an attitude, God, what are you going to say to me today? And I'm ready to hear your voice. And sometimes we just come and we, we listen, but we're not all that interested. In fact, we can go to the danger of actually judging the sermon. Oh, well, I think that was a good sermon. <laughs> that wasn't so good. And we become judges, and, and at the end of the message, sometimes we'll say, oh, that was a good message. Or wasn't he a good speaker? But is that what it's about? Is it about us coming? Think of this, it's a subtle thing, but if we come and we're there, we become professional evaluators of what we're listening to. So we're, in a sense, becoming judges rather than receiving like little children. What do I need to hear, Lord? You have something for me to hear. I need to hear it. So sometimes we're like these people judging whether it's good. You know, I once um, was praying for my parents before they got saved, and they came down Thanksgiving, actually. They came down to Victoria to visit, and they were going to be at church on Sunday. They said they would come, and it was my turn to preach. Well, they asked me to preach on that occasion. And I, wait, I was really heavy in prayer because I wanted to see my parents saved. And I think everybody in the place knew that I was preaching the gospel for them. And uh, I, I was so burdened in prayer about it, very anxious that, that they would hear and respond to the gospel. And afterwards, I went up to my father and he says, son, you're a good speaker. And that's not what I wanted to hear. You see, what we do with the speaking or the speaker is we evaluate. And we kind of say, well, that was nice. That's not what we're supposed to do with the Word of God. We're supposed to come to learn, to hear the voice of God. If we see tears of repentance, 
That's what we want to see. If we see people jumping out of their chair in joy, jubilating because of what God has done, that's what we want to see. We want to see response to the Word of God. That's why we come together. So our assembly should be a school. A school. We should come under conviction by what we hear and be willing to respond to what we have heard from the Word of God. I'm guilty of this just like anybody else. I think, oh, brother, so-and-so, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you, you kind of get this idea that what you're expecting and what you're going to get out of it. But our, our response really needs to be, you know, Lord, uh, you know, help me to hear your voice today. Help me to respond and to be prepared to obey. Be prepared to obey. To listen to the word of God with a thought, Lord, I need to obey this better. I need to do better in this area. And to have that, that hunger for the... Um, the revelation of the Holy Spirit. You know, I was saved in uh, 1989. This is an old picture of me when I was a young guy. I'm old. <laughs> Not as old as some of you, but I was old. I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> um, but I was saved by reading the Bible on my own. And um, when, I, when I got saved, I, I couldn't put the Bible down. I was just so hungry. This was all new to me, and I just wanted to learn as much as I could. Going to the assembly was a treat. I couldn't wait to go. And, you know, they, they used to have Bible study on Wednesday night, and the men around the table, they would share and talk about the Word of God. I wrote everything down. For like two years, I didn't say a peep. I just wrote. I just wrote books. And they all looked at me like, what's going on with this young guy? But I just couldn't get enough. Now, I'm not saying they were all great scholars or anything, but I was so hungry. I just wanted to learn. I wanted to know. And this was my school. This is where I was going to learn. Now, it's not an academic school, is it? It's a spiritual school where we learn to grow in Christ, in Christ-likeness, not just knowledge. We can go to school, a secular school, and we learn knowledge. And we ought to learn the Bible, but we've got to grow with that knowledge. We've got to respond to what we're hearing. So... In my own experience, I remember reading my Bible the first time and you know, reading it with serious attention. And I began reading in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I kept saying in my heart, this is true. This is true. This man really did these miracles. And I was just overcome with a, a sense of fascination and joy at learning about Jesus and what he did. And it, it came to a point where I felt God speaking to me one day. I didn't hear a voice, but I, I felt God speaking to me, saying, Daniel, I revealed my son to you. Will you receive him or will you reject him? And I knew at that moment I was in danger of falling into hell. I just knew it in my heart. That's a witness of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was testifying to me. Well, I didn't waste any time. I bowed my, my head and my heart, and I asked Jesus to be my Savior. And my Lord, and something happened. Something I hardly knew what it meant to be born again, but something happened that day, and I was changed forever. And from that point on, I couldn't wait to learn more. I didn't know what a commentary was. I didn't know what a Bible dictionary was. I just knew the Lord Jesus loved me and saved me. And I just started this journey of learning and growing. And the Word of God was such a, a delight to me then. Still is, but I wish I still had that youthful zeal and, and love and appreciation for God's Word, just being alone with your Bible and just learning all these new things. Now, may we never lose that sense of wonder of what it is to be a child of God. And you never, you never really explore the full riches of what God has revealed to us. You can read this book your whole life, and you'll never reach the full depth of it. There's so much for us to gain, so much for us to learn. Now, I've learned, I've studied over the years, the New Testament fairly comprehensively, gone through all the chapters of the New Testament and done lessons on them. I've worked through Old Testament overviews of most books of the Old Testament, but from Isaiah to Malachi, I haven't dug deep. I haven't really studied those books well. That's where I need to learn. That's my area where I need to grow, and I really want to invest into that and learn more. That's my own experience. So I know for myself, it's work, it's energy to get into the Bible and really learn it. Isaiah is not easy. <laughs> Maybe some of you really are scholars of, of Isaiah, but I find that not an easy way to, to learn uh, through a book like that. 
But by God's help through the Holy Spirit, we can we can learn these books and master them. And we need to learn the whole counsel of God if we're to be useful in the kingdom of God. It'd be a shame, wouldn't it, if you were in the assembly for 20 years and there were sections of the Bible that you never were familiar with, never really studied. I'm not saying comprehensively, but had some familiarity with. You know, like, um, well, well, we'll get into this a little bit later, but Paul, Paul here says that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. The pillar and ground of the truth. And that is, the church upholds the truth. We proclaim the truth. We live the truth. And the truth is to be seen in our lives. And um, God's truth will stand. God's truth will always stand. Whether we fail, whether our generation fails the Lord or not, God's word will prevail. It will always stand. But the church is intended to be an upholder of the truth, to uphold it and to proclaim it to the world. And, of course, we have the full revelation given to us almost 2,000 years ago. The canon of Scripture was complete, and it still stands with us today. Against all the attacks, all the enemies, the Word of God stands. There are many people who have tried to pull it down and discredit it in many ways, but it still stands. Now, in Ephesus, Paul is writing to Timothy, who spent much of his time in Ephesus. At that time, Timothy would have seen this structure. It's called the uh, Temple of Artemis. And it was one of the great wonders of the ancient world. It was a magnificent building. It stood 25 meters tall. This is just a model of it. You can see shrubs on the side to get the scale of the model. But the original temple looked like this, but it was 25 meters high. It's like 80 feet or something. It's quite high. And it had, I think, 217 pillars. No, 127 pillars, sorry. And it was 6,000 square feet. So when you looked at it, it was pretty impressive. And you thought, man, that thing's going to last forever. <laughs> Nothing's going to knock it down. But a couple of centuries later, it was destroyed, 263 AD. And those, those little believers, those little group of believers that met in Ephesus, I don't know if they met in somebody's home. It doesn't say they had a building or anything. But those little group of believers, they probably thought... Maybe tell me, think, that's not that very, very impressive, you know. When we look around the room, it doesn't look that impressive, does it? But the Word of God stands today, and temples will come and go. All of man's achievements, all of his false religion will fail, but the Word of God will never fail. We have something to rely on, something that is ever, never changing. In generations before us, men stood on this book, and it still stands. It still stands, and we need to be men and women who stand on the Word of God and to learn the Word of God, invest our lives into it. Um, when we understand our responsibility then as a pillar and ground of the truth, we realize that we want to uphold what God has revealed. We want to accurately convey that to the world. We're talking about a testimony, a lampstand, but we also want to be intelligent believers. People today will undermine the Bible and say, oh, the earth is not 6,000 years old. We have to know how to, know, to, to study our Bible in such a way that we can answer the skeptics and say, all that you say, all your religion ideas, it'll be gone, but this book will stand. It will always stand. It is the truth. It's revealed truth. Those of us who know it need to learn it so that we can answer the gainsayers and help them to understand that this book is reliable and it can be depended on. But that only happens when we take our responsibility to learn it, to know it well, so we can quote it to people and show its transforming power in the lives of uh, those who believe its message and trust in Christ. In order for us to learn the Bible, we need quality teaching. We need quality teaching. This is a picture that's supposed to depict Jesus walking with the two on the road to Emmaus. And you'll remember when the Lord Jesus joined those two, they didn't immediately recognize who it was. But he began teaching them through the scriptures, the Psalms, the uh, Moses, and the Psalms, and the prophets. Three sections of the Old Testament, the historical, the poetic, and the prophetic areas of scripture. And he walked through that and gave them a Bible lesson on how the Christ must first suffer and then enter into his glory. What a Bible lesson. And they said, they testified, did not our hearts burn within us? as we walked with him by the way. When we have good teaching, it should affect us. We should say, wow, this is great. I remember sitting at a conference as a young believer with David Gooding as the teacher. 
Anybody remember that name, David Gooding? He's a fabulous teacher of the Bible, fabulous. And as a young believer, my head was just, just spinning. <laughs> I couldn't handle all the information that was coming to me. But he showed levels of correlation between Ephesians and Joshua, things that I just couldn't imagine that the Bible revealed to us. And as I study the scripture over many years, I've been studying now for about 30 years, there's so many things there I know I've only scratched the surface of. So many beautiful things for us to unfold and learn. I remember when I was at work one time carrying my Bible through the work area through on lunch break and I'm walking through this work area and one fellow shouted across the room, Daniel, haven't you finished that book yet? I said, this book, you never finish. You never finish this book. And he says, no, but Daniel, when you read a book, you put it down, pick up another one. I said, no, you don't understand. This book you can study your whole life and only begin the journey of trying to understand. And he says, no, 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 get on to something else, Daniel. Don't waste your time on that. So I opened up my book to Hebrews, chapter 1. And I had him read the first three verses of Hebrews. God, who at sundry times, divers manner, speak to the fathers in time past by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by son, not by his son, by son, and, and so forth, reading that passage. So he read the first three verses, and I said, so what did that mean? <laughs> What did you get from that? Oh, well, you know, it's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of this and that. I said, no. No, I said, you could study the Bible your whole life and not enter the depths of what God has revealed right there. You know, the Bible is a marvelous book. And I had, it, it was a whole crowd around us. So I had a great opportunity to witness to all my workmates and show the value of the Word of God. It's a tremendous thing that we're supposed to do. So we need to have quality teaching. We need to have spirit-led teaching. It's not just being academic. You can go to uh, Bible school and learn all the theology and all the in-depth uh, studies, but that's not necessarily equating with the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit illuminates our understanding. There are people much smarter than I, much smarter than you, who are very academic, who can read the Bible and understand the words written on the page. And they can use it to criticize the Bible and say, oh, the Bible believes in slavery and genocide. And as they see the message not correctly, because they're not indwelt by the Holy Spirit or illuminated by the Holy Spirit. And that's what we need, spirit-led quality ministry. Imagine the Lord Jesus walking with you, by the way, and telling you all the things in the scriptures. Your heart would burn within you. Now, this requires that elders teach. One of the qualifications of an elder is that they're apt to teach. So among many things that an elder does, he has a teaching ministry. That doesn't necessarily mean he has a public teaching ministry. Some elders, I know one in Edmonton, for instance, who is truly a shepherd of God's people. He knows the Bible. And he's not an excellent, like he's not an orator. He can't speak from the platform very well. But if you sit alone with him, you will learn. And he cares and loves for God's people and always applies the word of God to their life. But it should be this. Every elder should be apt to teach. That's a requirement. And that's one of his main responsibilities is to convey the word of God. He is to feed the flock. And of course, feeding means to learn the Bible and explain it to others. This is an area where we need to think about carefully in the assembly because sometimes um, elders aren't given the time. They're not given the time. Um, I'm not even sure we have to say they're gifted to teach. A gift might be something different, but they have to apply themselves. To, uh, when Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, mm -hmm. we are to honor those or give them double honor who rule well and who labor in word and doctrine. Labor in word and doctrine. So what does that mean, double honor? In the same context of 1 Timothy 5, it's talking about caring for widows. And it says a widow who's a widow indeed, somebody who has proven themselves in their care for the saints, walked faithfully for the Lord, reached a certain age, was destitute, didn't have children to look after her. She was to be taken into the number. And that means the church has a responsibility to make sure she was fed, that she had her basic needs met. What about an elder? Double honor. Double honor, it says. Now, in the assemblies, I think we have a glaring blind spot. We believe in a New Testament pattern of a plurality of leaders. 
We believe that. We believe that's biblical, and it is. It's biblical. But what a lot of churches have done is they've adopted the idea of hiring a pastor, right? A lot of churches in Prince George have a pastor, and he is called the pastor of the church, and they pay him a salary. And so when you go to that church, you probably get pretty good teaching because he spends his time at it. But most of our elders work full time. They have some job that they're doing. And because they're involved in secular work, and they work maybe 40 or 50 hours a week, and then they have to tend to their children and their wife, and they're cutting the grass and taking the car to get an oil change and doing all those practical things in life, their time for studying the Word of God is quite limited. Now, it can be done, but I think we cripple these men when we ask them to do this work. Shepherding is a full-time job. It really is. To care for God's people takes time. You can't go and visit the saints. You can't counsel people. You can't study the Word of God and teach regularly, consistently, the Word of God to others if you're encumbered and you're, you're taxed too much. And that's what we do to our elders. I thank God for some men who know their Bible well, who've studied it well, and have been managed to somehow tend to their children and their wives and their job and their cutting the grass and whatever else they have to do. But that's a really difficult challenge for most men. And it's why the quality of teaching lacks in many assemblies. So I would challenge you, this is a burden of mine, in the assemblies to think about how we can support our elders. There's a young man in, um, in West Bank Bible Chapel right now. His name's Collins. He's a good preacher. And he's getting a lot of invitations to go around. And I think a young guy like that with such potential so much investment in the Word of God, and he's really studying. He's got an office downstairs, all his books are there, and he goes there several times a week and studies the Word of God. I think it would be great if the assembly said, let's help that guy. I'm not saying pay him a salary. I'm saying, but recognize that God has his hand on him, and he could be a benefit to the church. You know what happens? I'm a missionary, and I've gone off to serve the Lord in Africa. And as such, most people understand, oh, he's living by faith, let's help him out. And so everywhere we go, we get support. And when I first started out, not that many people knew me, the support was little. But as people have gotten to know us, the support increases. And so what happens is somebody like myself can devote themselves to serving the Lord, studying the scriptures, pastoring, caring for the flock. And that works for a missionary. And, and I'm thankful for that. I, I'm so glad to be in the Lord's work and be supported but I sympathize with other men who work in the local assembly and want to labor and they want to do that work, but they're crippled from doing it because we haven't seen or understood this part of the scripture. Maybe in our zeal to keep a biblical pattern of a plurality of elders, we're afraid to support them. We're afraid to do that. But the Bible says that we should double honor them. We should honor them. And I challenge you to think about that. Peter says, not for filthy lucre, right? So the elder is not to be motivated by money, but that means money might have been part of it, right? Timothy says, or Paul says, Timothy, the worker is worthy of his wages. Why is it that spiritual labor we don't value more? We pay a lot of money for a building. We pay a lot of money for hymn books and organs and electronics. But do we help people? who are laboring for the Word of God. I think one of our problems is this. In Canada, we all live very luxury lives. We have nice houses, nice cars, and we can't afford to give all of that to somebody. But in the New Testament context, people had a much poorer culture. And Jesus said, with food and clothing, be content. So I think maybe we could find a good compromise and say, you know what? If a brother's feeding me, I can feed him. I'll give him a little money for food or bring him a meal or I will just encourage him by giving him maybe some Bible books, some, some money to buy some study books or material, or some way that we can help somebody and encourage them and say, you know what, I see God's hand upon you. I see that he wants to use you to teach the people of God. And if we really value that, and we want the assemblies to grow, then we need to invest in people who are willing to teach. That way we'll get better teaching. Sometimes the other denominations, they have great teachers. Now, we don't agree with the biblical model, but what we should understand is that they are somehow supporting, not the way we would do it, but they are supporting somebody to teach the Word of God. And they have one man, and he's the pastor, and if he gets off track, they're all off track.
We're all to be students of the word. But let's remember we need biblical elders. And I don't want to be too hard on elders because, as I say, elders aren't often given the opportunity. They may have the willingness, but they're not given the opportunity because they have to balance out a busy life schedule and still try to tend to all the needs of the saints. And it just seems, in my estimation, not possible to do a good job as an elder while you're doing a full-time job. And by the time you're retired, you're tired. You know, you don't have the zeal and the energy you had when you were 25. So it's pretty hard to do that. And one of the things we like to do is we get on the phone and say, Brother so-and-so, you want to come and preach? <laughs> and we invite these other preachers to come in. And I've seen this in a lot of assemblies. The elders are always calling on somebody else to teach. Now, it's okay. We want to invite people to give us a word, and sometimes we need that. But I think the New Testament pattern would be raising up men in our midst who can apply themselves to the Word of God and teach the Word of God. Now, I've listened to a lot of messages, a lot of sermons in my life. And I enjoy listening to the Word of God. And I can evaluate, you know, like we have those little <laughs> numbers. That was good. That was bad. But we all have our favorites. You know, I like that brother. He speaks to my heart. But I appreciate everybody who puts effort in. I appreciate him. A young guy, maybe he hasn't got the depth in the Scripture. But I see he's put his time in. He's really gone to the Word and he's prayed and asked God to bless that ministry. I appreciate that as well as the senior ones who've been walking with the Lord for years and have such a wealth to share, we have to appreciate every brother who puts time in. But what ideally the New Testament would envision is that we raise up men among our own who can facilitate the teaching of the Word of God. We can't rely on other people always coming in to feed the flock. The shepherds know the sheep. They love the sheep. They know the needs of the sheep. They're best equipped to share the Word of God in a relevant way so that they can hear it. Yes, speakers, okay, but that's not the best. And that's a trend I'm seeing growing in a lot of assemblies. They're just calling on other people. Thank God for those. Maybe there's one or two men, and they're not, they, they just have to really pour themselves into the Word of God because there's not a lot available. And they Sunday by Sunday are available to teach and feed and nurture the people of God or go on a visit and counsel somebody who needs some counseling. So, uh, yeah, I've been to Bible conferences. I love that, to go and enjoy fellowship and listen to good teaching. Recently, Lawrence was down at the Digging Deeper, and we had some excellent Bible teaching. But um, those are good for occasions like this Thanksgiving conference or other occasions when we have special uh, times of meeting together and feeding, feasting on the Word of God. But the regular... Uh, teaching in the assembly should be ongoing, consecutive, quality teaching from able brothers. What if we don't have able brothers? What do we do? What if we don't have a strong Bible teacher in our midst? We need to pray. Because the assembly is only as strong as its leadership. Right? Any school needs teachers, qualified teachers. If you have poor teachers, you're going to have poor school. The elders need to recognize if they're not strong in teaching, maybe they don't have that exercise or ability, you need to pray that God would raise up men. I'm so grateful at West Bank. When I went there a few years ago, it was just a lot of gray hairs. There wasn't a lot of young men. There wasn't a lot of gift or ability or exercise for preaching. Now there's three young men there, all able to preach, all with an exercise for the things of God. They all work. They all have their secular jobs. But I'm so grateful because it looks so promising for the future of the assembly because they can open the word of God and teach and feed the people of God. Now we need the whole counsel of God. We don't just need the same message year after year after year. We need to hear what all of God says. Now, as I was saying, I've studied through the Bible, read through it, but there are certain areas uh, <clears throat> we don't tackle too much. We should have a ministry in the church where we walk through all of Scripture. A couple of years ago, I told the elders in Africa, we've done a lot in the New Testament over the years, but we haven't tackled the Old Testament. I said, we need to cover the whole counsel of God. So let's do an overview. Not an in-depth study, because the Old Testament's pretty big. It's pretty hard going. I said, let's do an overview. 
So I started doing these overviews for a couple of weeks. I would go through the Genesis, Exodus, whatever. And then they would take up each a, a lesson from that book. We were trying to make it general, but it's hard to do a general message on the book of Genesis. Maybe the book of Ruth would be a much easier one to tackle. But we've been walking through that for the last three years or so, and we're trying to get the whole counsel of God. When I go back, my intention is to start studying, picking up where I left off in Isaiah and work through the Malachi. That's going to be good for me, and I know it'll be good for the assembly. We mustn't miss it. Anything in the in the Word of God. Have you ever heard somebody preach on Zephaniah? It's kind of one of those books you just quickly read, three chapters, gone, Zephaniah. We never think too much about it. I've heard one message, one gospel message many years ago on Zephaniah. I, I, I don't think I've ever heard somebody preach on Nahum. You know that book called Nahum? <laughs> it's in our Bible. Um, and Obadiah. Obadiah is only one chapter. But there's, I don't think I've ever heard anybody preach on it. But we need preaching on the whole Bible, every bit of it. It's all God's word. And there's something in each, each chapter of the Bible has something unique that we need. We can't ignore any part of it. So we need to be careful to receive the whole counsel of God. And that's what the assembly should be doing, should be looking at. You know, we haven't tackled the minor prophets. This year, let's tackle the minor prophets. Or maybe, okay, last year we did Romans. This year, let's do Corinthians. Let's um, work through the Bible. Let's do the whole counsel of God so we can, we can learn, because this is what we're supposed to be doing, learning. We're students. We have to learn the Word of God. Um, we need excellence in Bible teaching. Excellence in Bible teaching. This is a picture of um, Charles Ryrie. I don't know if you know that name. He was a great Bible teacher great theologian. He taught at Dallas Theological Seminary. He helped me a lot in my young Christian life because I had a Ryrie study Bible, and all the Ryrie study notes were excellent. It really helped me to understand the basic doctrines of salvation, of sin, of Satan, of God, all these things. A really good foundation for me as a young believer. And of course, William McDonald was somebody who personally discipled me, and I really enjoyed spending time with William McDonald. I learned a lot from his personal example. He's a godly man. He lived a godly Christian life. And it was so nice to be in his company and see the gracious spirit and the humble spirit by which he operated. But he was an exceptional Bible teacher. He was a very capable Bible teacher. And I've read through his commentary. That was part of our curriculum when we were in California under his tutelage. So I know his, his take on a lot of things. And there's very little I would disagree with him on. And how dare I disagree with such a great Bible teacher. But we're to be Bereans, right? And test all things with Scripture. And there's a couple of things where I might say, well, Bill, I'm not so sure I agree with you on that one. But boy, do I respect his ability. He spent his life investing into the Word of God. And you know, with some people, there's a lot more under the table than on the top. <laughs> there's a lot hidden there that you don't see. The man really knew his stuff. He wrote a lot of books, and he wrote them in such a way that it was accessible to most believers. He didn't write way up here like Mr. Darby or Kelly or somebody like that, which is so not accessible to everybody. He made it accessible. I love that about him. So we need excellence in Bible teaching. And how do we do that? How do we get this kind of training, this kind of teaching in the assembly? Well, as I say, we've got a young man named Collins. We can invest into a life like that. I'm not saying send them off to Bible school, but invest into their life in such a way that we can encourage them, say, what you're doing is good. Study. And if you need a little financial help, here's some help for you. And if we can have a corporate exercise, we're all students of the word. We need to learn. We need to grow in the word of God. And God gifts some men to teach. He gives them that ability. And so we want to foster them. We want to help them to stir up the gift within them so that we can all benefit from that. And that's so important. We need quality teachers. And we can't have quality teachers unless we invest in them. In Galatians, it says, he who sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. And it's in the context of sharing with those who have shared the word of God with us. Do you value those who, who share the word of God with you? The people you've learned from? People who have invested many hours into studying scripture so that your soul can be nurtured? Sometimes we enjoy a good feast at the expense of others. Don't we? Somebody else bought the pizza tonight. I didn't buy it. Well, that was something I could enjoy because somebody else spent the money. 
We should think of the word of God similarly. Let's not cheapen the word of God by letting people labor for our benefit and not valuing it by valuing their sacrifice. However that happens, however that happens, and I would just challenge us to really think through this because we want the assembly to be a school, a place of spiritual nurture, and we should not be biblically ignorant. If we've been a Christian for any sense of time, we should know the Bible. We should value it. We should ask the Holy Spirit to reveal truth to us. So no matter whether we're young or old, when people encounter us, they encounter the Bible. They know the Bible. I'm just thinking of some young men in Africa. We have Isaac. I've spoken to you about Isaac before, how much scripture he's memorized. He's memorized over 300 chapters of the Bible, you know, and he is something of a walking Bible. Now, you can pray for Isaac. He has some health issues now, and he's often weak and sickly, but um, I, I thank God that he's invested as a young man so much time into memorizing Scripture because if he gets into a debate with somebody at work about the Scriptures, all he has to say, well, the Word of God says, and quote it because he knows it. It's there. And that's a beautiful thing when we take time to, to learn the Word of God. So let's invest ourselves. Invest ourselves into learning the Word of God, sharing it liberally with others, and investing into those who teach. The assembly is only as strong as its teachers or leaders. And one of the reasons the assemblies are weak is because we haven't seen the importance of valuing the individual who is willing to teach us. We'll spend thousands of dollars on a new car. We'll spend thousands of dollars on a vacation. We will put in a new garden in our, in our yard or renovate our house. We will we'll find all kinds of ways to spend money. But are we willing to sacrifice for the ministry of God's word? You know, in some churches, they tie. They give 10%. And they collect all that money from all the congregation. It probably takes at least maybe two or 300 people to support one pastor, one man, to give him a full-time salary so he can live in a decent home and feed his kids. Um, but in a small assembly, we can't afford that. We don't have those kind of resources. But we can encourage one another to be in the Word. And even if we come along, if you don't have money to do it, you can go up and say, Brother, I so thank God for you that you are investing into the Word of God. I've been blessed because you studied, because you learned the Word of God. And maybe have them over for a lunch and encourage them. You can share a little fellowship with them. That would be encouraging to them. Even some men, they have lots of resources. But to say, you know what, I love you. I appreciate you. Here is something to show my appreciation. Then they feel like I'm, I'm getting somewhere here. I'm, I'm, these people are appreciating what I'm doing. I'm not saying we would lift up men in pride. We don't want proud people teaching the word of God. Everything comes from the Lord. We didn't receive anything that we didn't get from the Lord. But a preacher, I can tell you, I've preached a lot, and sometimes it's a little discouraging. You put a lot of time and prayer into a message. You share, you put your heart into it, and people say, oh, nice message, go home and forget about it. You think, well, Lord, is it really worth all the effort? Is it really? Is it? But one brother came to me one morning. I never go to the back usually when I preach, because if I go to the back of the chapel, People will all come and smile and feel obligated to say, oh, Daniel, that was a nice message. I don't want anybody to feel that way. I would rather them feel exercised to come and meet me if they have something to say. So I would just sit in the front. And one brother came to me one Sunday morning, and he just sat beside me. He says, Daniel, you really speak to people. You really speak to people. I, I hope it's not me. I hope it's the Holy Spirit. But it was just the right thing he said to just encourage my heart and say, you know what, okay, Lord, Thank you. I just needed that little lift, that little boost to keep going. The Word of God and our coming together, we all know that we come to hear the Word of God, but let's value it. Let's appreciate it. Let's raise up teachers among us because otherwise we're missing our purpose. We're missing out on our purpose. We're to be a light, but we're to be a school, which means we have to be good learners. We have to be willing to invest in the Word of God. And if our elders, teachers, are weak, let's pray that God will give them strength and ability to do that. We'll raise up strong young men with vision and ability to teach and, and uh, help the assembly. So I think that's it. That's it. Um, yeah, it says the end of the message. So 
I hope that's been a help. I hope that's been encouraging to you. Let's um, make sure we're a pillar and ground of the truth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for entrusting us with your word. And sometimes <clears throat> we haven't seen the value and purpose of learning the word of God so that we can not only be a light, but we can be a teacher. I remember the first time somebody asked me to teach the Bible. And I thought, how in the world can I say anything of value to anybody? But somehow you took my feeble voice and you used it to touch somebody else. And I thank you for that, Father. I pray that we all will take up the word of God and uh, bring delight to your heart as we enjoy it, as we study it and uh, invest into it, that we wow. dig out its riches and share it liberally with those that um, are around us. Whether, whether it's a witness on the street or a friend or an encouragement, somebody sick or somebody suffering, whatever it might be, help us to learn it so that we can apply it carefully to all the needs. And, oh, Father, we pray you would raise up men, raise up men here at Kelly Road, who can take up the word of God and teach. But we need that. We need good teaching. We need quality teaching. And we need men who are filled with the Holy Spirit and delight to do your work. So, Father, we pray, would you bless the assembly here with some teachers, with some who know the word of God and will invest their life into sharing it. For we know that the assembly is only as strong as its leaders and teachers so we pray you will bless this assembly, others around British Columbia, to have the same, a, uh, a ministry in the word which is valuable and, and edifying for the saints, that we all might grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.